Hemp Diseases in Kentucky, Spring 2020. One of the biggest misconceptions about industrial hemp is that it is disease resistant. And I can tell you that there is nothing further from the truth. Hemp is not disease resistant. It's not insect resistant. Um, and it is an agronomic or horticultural crop depending on the approach that the grower takes. And disease is absolutely a consideration for uh, growers in both indoor and outdoor environments. In Kentucky, hemp has been a commodity since 2014. In fact, acreage has increased very rapidly. And last year in 2019, about 26,000 acres of hemp were planted. Within those acres, 92% uh, were grown for CBD or cannabidiol. So the cannabinoid, um, the cannabinoid crops are um, very different than the hemp that we know from our, our American history or Kentucky history. In fact, the genetics are different. The approach to planting is very different. CBD hemp or cannabinoid hemp, those grown uh, for floral material or spaced very widely. Rows are spaced widely. The plant is highly branched and it is bred for, um, for that large flower and for um, certain, certain traits. And as we see, it is those, those traits that might, might contribute to some of the disease susceptibility that we see. Some things to think about as we consider hemp and hemp disease is that the, the origin of these cultivars are not, um, are not uh, uh, American bred, right? So they are coming from, or the genetics at least, are coming from Europe and Canada and Asia in environments that are very different than the environment that we have here in Kentucky. So as we bring these plants in, we have um, hot summers, sometimes very wet summers, high humidity, those types of things. And that really matters as we take a plant outside of its native range and put it into a new environment. And in these cases, that may be a contributing factor towards some of the disease susceptibility that we're seeing in hemp in Kentucky. Um, think too, when we think about um, the genetics and the people who are breeding some of this hemp, um, a lot of those genetics are, are coming from the THC industry, right? So THC um, cannabis is, is uh, grown in an indoor environment, not even a greenhouse, but in closed environments, very highly regulated um, conditions, environmental conditions are regulated. So those, all of those, those situations in which these, um, these, these parentage come from is different than we're seeing in the field or, or even in greenhouses in Kentucky. Many of these genetics are recent introductions. And as we introduce new, um, new, new varieties into the system, they haven't been tested yet. They, we don't have enough history to know which ones are the most susceptible to disease, which ones um, may, maybe have some resistance that can go into the next line of breeding stock. So all of those things are really important as we consider how much disease will affect our hemp crop and what we can do to reduce the amount of disease, especially in regard to uh, disease resistance. During the past six years, we have my program and, and, and my colleagues throughout the College of Agriculture have uh, been doing a survey across the state of Kentucky, looking at hemp in greenhouses and fields and trying to determine what the disease situation is, which diseases are out there, which pathogen host combinations um, are the most important, which ones are the most relevant, where disease losses occur, and where we may see disease that's subtle and um, not quite as, um, as important in terms of disease loss, but maybe one that we should monitor. So over the past six years, we have found over 25 different diseases that affect hemp. Uh, some of the, the major ones we see here on this list, it, this is just a summary, well, you'll see some really kind of some familiar ones like Botrytis gray mold and um, Cercospora leaf spot, 
fusarium head blight. Um, so some really common ones and then some others that may not be familiar. Uh, some that are very new, new to us as well as a matter of fact. Hemp leaf spot or bipolaris leaf spot is very new. Um, septoria leaf spot, um, not the septorias that we see in tomato for example uh, or bramble. So we're seeing some new pathogens or, or maybe the, a, a familiar genus but a new species in some situations and in other situations we're definitely identifying cross infection from a more familiar um, commodity, a more familiar crop, or even um, a cross infection from a weed host onto hemp. So in terms of hemp and the uses for hemp and the types of hemp that are grown in, in, in fields and in greenhouses, uh, we can pretty much break it into three types of hemp, fiber hemp, grain hemp, and those grown for floral material. So fiber and grain hemp is grown in very close proximity, heavy, um, heavy spa uh, seed spacing in, in an allotted amount of, of area, whereas the CBD or CBG, um, hemp grown for flower for cannabinoids, is grown more of a horticultural crop. It can be grown outdoors or indoors, or um, it could grow, be grown on uh, raised beds, on flat rows, on plastic, um, like a horticultural crops. So there are a lot of different approaches that we see. A lot of growers coming in using the tobacco model, for example. So there are a lot of different approaches to growing it that way. So usually we kind of think in terms of fiber, grain, and cannabinoid type systems. But in terms of diseases, disease identification and disease management, I like to divide it more into um, outdoor grown hemp versus indoor grown hemp. It, the diseases are, are pretty distinct, um, not a whole lot of uh, separation when it comes to um, what the usage is, but very much um, the location of that crop and which diseases will affect it. So that's how I'm going to approach this, uh, this talk. So let's begin with greenhouse diseases. Um, and when I talk about greenhouses, here in Kentucky, we pretty much grow hemp in a traditional greenhouse. We have a few high tunnels. Um, I have not seen any low tunnels as of yet. And just a couple of growers have a complete um, indoor environment. So I'm gonna just talk about greenhouses. Most of the time though, any indoor environment is pretty similar. Our primary greenhouse diseases in Kentucky um, on hemp are powdery mildew, botrytis canker, uh, pythium root rot, and uh, we're seeing downy mildew. I was going to mention downy mildew. So let's start talking about powdery mildew. Uh, powdery mildew is a familiar disease to a lot of people. There are a lot of types of powdery mildews out there. So um, all powdery mildews um, are... Um, pretty distinct when it comes to um, the mycelia or the fungal growth. The signs are visible on the top sides of leaves, sometimes on the bottom sides, on succulent growth. Um, in general, the powdery mildew pathogens are host specific. So usually, for instance, the powdery mildew on hydrangea is not the same powdery mildew that you'll see on dogwood. And that's not the same powdery mildew you would see on, for instance, your strawberry uh, plants. And on hemp, um, for a very long time, um, the, the, I call the historical literature, has told us that the powdery mildew we're seeing on hemp is the same powdery mildew that we see on hops because hops and hemp are both in the same family. Um, but what we have found, and, and our, um, my colleagues in neighboring states um, have also found that the powdery mildew we're seeing on hemp uh, for us is Golovinomyces spadaceus, and my colleagues in Canada and, and even some of my other colleagues are finding a Golovinomyces chicoraceara. Very, very close related, but both Golovinomyces, uh, bo both with a, a broader host range, and uh, for the Golovinomyces spadaceus, we see it a lot in um, asters, in um, amaranths. So this is more of a weed powdery mildew one that we see a lot outside, for instance, outside of the greenhouses. So if we kind of think about uh, how this, this, um, this specific identification matters for this powdery mildew, well, we're not bringing it in. It's very unlikely that we're bringing powdery mildew in 
from, for instance, our plug producer, but instead it's probably coming into our greenhouses through the vents, through open doors. So this is a native or a locally occurring powdery mildew. In a greenhouse situation where the humidity is high, we see powdery mildew that can become really severe. It can stunt plants, especially young plants. Once we get it outside, however, we kind of see it dissipate. In very few situations do we see powdery mildew even easily visible on the field level. So even plugs that are or transplants that are infected on the greenhouse level, we're not really seeing that um, become a problem once they're moved outdoors. That being said, however, it is illegal to sell diseased plants. So greenhouse growers cannot disregard powdery mildew because they cannot sell those plants, even if a grower is going to take them outside where it won't be a problem. The next disease or, or, or couple of diseases I want to mention are the botrytis or the gray mold diseases. Um, I particularly want to hone in on botrytis canker. So the word canker means a woody lesion. And so botrytis canker is a woody lesion that is caused by the gray mold pathogen botrytis. I see this a lot in greenhouses where, especially on mother plants, where growers are clipping and snipping and taking cuttings from mother plants. Um, so the botrytis pathogen is a very weak pathogen. It's opportunistic and it really moves into uh, dying or wounded or stressed plant tissue. So when we have a lot of cutting going on, especially clippings, cuttings taken from mother plants, there's a lot of wounding going on. And if humidity is high and if the, um, if the situation, the environmental conditions are conducive, then botrytis is ready to colonize those areas. And once colonization occurs, it can start causing girdling. And girdling means that it'll just start decaying the outer, the outer surface of that area. And it'll, as it expands, it'll cut off the flow of uh, water and nutrients to the upper parts of the plant. The plant can get very brittle and we can even see some breakage at that, at that area. And while we're at it, let me point out, and this is true for, um, for all of our, our fungi and bacteria. So with plant pathogens, they need two major things to complete their life cycles. They need free water and moderate temperatures. So in terms of moderate temperatures, that means not too hot and not too cold. That's why we typically see um, plant diseases, especially in spring and in fall, for example, when the, when the temperatures are, are moderate, or in, in other words, if you're comfortable, the pathogen is comfortable. Um, and, and in terms of free water, free water can mean any way that, that the humidity level is above, say, 70%. And that varies. Some pathogens need a very high humidity, like 80 or 90 percent. Others need can can tolerate lower humidity. Uh, for instance, the powdery mildews will tolerate a lower humidity. But um, so any type of, of free water that can be fog or relative humidity, and in terms of greenhouses, it's relative humidity. It could be rain. It could be irrigation. Think about greenhouse conditions in particular. There's always, always water. There's always high humidity, wet floors, wet surfaces. So as you manage greenhouse conditions, it's very important that you keep the fans running. You open those sidewalls or the ends up and really exchange air, particularly in the spring. Sometimes it's a little bit cold out and we kind of hesitate to do that air exchange because we're running a heater. Um, so making sure to monitor relative humidity and for about $10, um, you can get a cheap temperature uh, a thermometer that will also measure humidity. Very important that that is monitored. Okay, so back to botrytis canker. Um, so botrytis, again, is an opportunistic pathogen. It can infect or affect lots of different weak uh, wounded tissue, not just hemp. So it's everywhere and um, it, it can really come in when you've got a stressed plant. Uh, botrytis can also cause a tip blight, so young succulent leaves, especially when there's plant stress, 
maybe tip burn if you uh, let your plants get a little bit dry and you had some tip burn or marginal leaf scorch on the leaves or any other kinds of stresses, especially succulent tissue, if the humidity is high and uh, botrytis populations are high in the greenhouse, they can come into tips. And if, if you really have uh, young susceptible plants, botrytis can really stunt them badly. All right, the next group of pathogens are the pythiums. So pythium causes root rot. It can cause a damping off. Um, so um, in terms of damping off, we'll talk about that a little bit later in the field, especially if you're direct seeding. But if you're seeding in the greenhouse, damping off um, can occur. But pythium, uh, pythium, so we have lots of different kind. I've identified five different pythium species in hemp in Kentucky over the last six years. But the pythiums are soil-borne pathogens. They're not true fungi. They're oomycetes or water molds, um, as we can call them. They must have um, free water in order to complete their life cycle. So they like a lot of water. When you're watering a lot, these pathogens will proliferate. And in terms of root rot, so that is that is the, the pathogen source for, um, for infection. It will come in at root tips and it'll work its way up. So when we lose root tips or we lose roots, of course, the plant is not gonna be able to absorb, to uptake water and nutrients. So the upper plant parts are going to become uh, maybe chlorotic or, or, or indicate nutrient deficiencies. They can be stunted, they can be wilting. So there are a lot of um, upper plant uh, symptoms that can manifest themselves in many ways uh, if there is a root rot. So pythium, when, once pythium is in, so once it's introduced into a greenhouse, it can really proliferate because again, greenhouses are wet. There's a lot of water going on. These are soil-borne pathogens, so they'll attach themselves to soil particles and they'll, they'll fall under the benches. They'll stick to things, to the hose, to the bottoms of our shoes, to our tools, uh, wheelbarrows, buckets, those types of things, and they will remain in any of the, the soilless media, that type of thing. So um, also consider that greenhouses are mostly sterile or they're mostly free of pathogens. So once something like a pythium is introduced, it's very easy for it to proliferate when it's got the conditions it needs and no natural enemies. There are no antagonists uh, there. So this, this image uh, you'll see in the upper right, you'll see this area here. This is a very good symptom of pythium root rot. So the, when the root tip is infected, the cortex of the root is going to soften and even slough off very easily. And we see here just the steel is remaining. We call that a rat tail. So rat tail symptoms are very distinct and very easily um, uh, used to identify pythium root rots. Here is another one here. In terms of tobacco growers, so uh, tobacco float beds are, are a, a very common place that we see pythium root rots. Um, in fact, tobacco growers use fungicides on a regular basis to manage pythium in their float beds. But of course, there are no fungicides labeled for uh, pythium management in hemp. And secondly, hemp does not like wet feet. So that is a bit of a ticking time bomb um, when, when you're looking at putting hemp into a tobacco float system. I also want to mention that in a float system, these styrofoam trays that are used in float beds um, have a lot of porous surfaces, and that is really a, um, a very common place that oospores or the uh, pythium survival structures will stick. And so from season to season, the reuse of trays very commonly we can have um, we can have that over that overwintering or that survival of the pythium from one season to the next. So I highly recommend that growers avoid float beds and also to always avoid used trays when you're dealing with styrofoam trays. So even sterilization and disinfestation does not take care of it. So do not use used styrofoam trays uh, for hemp production.
Okay, so um, as I end my greenhouse disease session, I want to really kind of touch on um, abiotic problems that maybe look like diseases, that, but that are not actually plant diseases caused by plant pathogens. And by abiotic, I mean not living. These are problems caused by um, environmental conditions, et cetera. So some things that contribute to a lot of the abiotic problems that we see, and I will estimate that about half of the problems we see with hemp that are suspected to be disease are actually abiotic. So first of all, we have a lot of new growers that are coming into hemp, a lot of inexperienced growers that might not be familiar with some of the common practices. So we see a lot of um, what we might call rookie mistakes that occur especially in greenhouse production. Uh, greenhouse production is different than outdoor production, so sometimes that'll contribute to some common things like overwatering, um, those types of things. Uh, fertility is another one. We see a lot of nutrient deficiencies or nutrient toxicities, those kinds of things. Um, a lot of times those will look like plant diseases. And so we, we do see a lot of those things that, that will come through um, that are not diseases at all. And uh, as I said a minute ago, uh, overwatering, very common, especially in the greenhouse. Uh, hemp does not like wet feet. And so that really makes the problem worse. Um, this image shows a plant that is dead. Um, it is too late. It's <coughs> too late to diagnose. And once we, we reach this point, it's difficult to identify whether there is an actual plant pathogen or if what we're seeing is maybe a secondary pathogen that came in after, for instance, a cultural issue or some other abiotic issue. A lot of times, too, is that once a plant is dead, there are lots of saprobes present. And a saprobe is, is a fungus or a bacterium that consumes already dead plant matter. So the, the, the longer of, of tissue has been dead, the more of those saprobes that will be present. And it's hard to identify if there is a primary plant pathogen. It's hard to identify what it is. It's sort of like a needle in a haystack type of search. So once a plant has already died, it's usually too late for us to figure out what's going on, especially with a limited plant sample. All right, so let's move on to field diseases. So most of our hemp in Kentucky is grown at, in the field level, and this is by far where I see the most diseases. So this section is gonna be much longer uh, than the greenhouse section. So in terms of primary field diseases, I've broken them out. Uh, let's start with leaf diseases. Um, there are lots of leaf diseases out there, and I see some of them very often, and I see others not so often. So let's talk about some of the ones that are that are common. Um, anthracnose. We'll start with anthracnose leaf spot. Anthracnose leaf spot. We see um, we see here and there. Um, I really want to point this one out because it looks a lot like other leaf spots. And anthracnose leaf spot is one that is not important, not as of yet. We have not seen it become a problem. This in this image is an extreme case, but as you see, the tissue is still green. It hasn't affected this plant growth. And um, so as of now, anthracnose leaf spot is not something that we are worried about. Um, here in Kentucky, we have found anthracnose leaf spot to be caused by Colletotricum fiorinae. Um, this is one of the species that used to be classified as Colletotricum acutatum. And uh, what's, what's interesting about um, Colletotricum fiorinae is that it has a very wide host range, primarily fruits. So this is the one that causes apple bitter rot and ripe rot and blueberry and anthracnose fruit rot and strawberry, et cetera. Um, so this pathogen really likes fruit and here it is causing a leaf spot on, uh, on hemp. Um, and this one, um, this pathogen can also, it'll be in the, in the woods, in the forest. Um, it's known to in infect things like wild grapes and poison ivy, et cetera. It can cause tip lights and it can colonize cankers in trees that have, that are infected by something else. So it's a bit opportunistic at times. Um, it's aggressive in terms of, uh, fruit, 
but we think this is just one that's a bit opportunistic. So we're watching this one. It's interesting, um, but do pay attention to the symptoms, especially as we move through some of the other leaf spots and compare what those symptoms look like. All right, the next leaf spot is Cercospora leaf spot. So this, so Cercospora is a very common disease, Cercospora leaf spot. There are lots of crops that have Cercospora leaf spots. Um, usually they are caused by different species of Cercospora, um, and, but Cercospora are overall um, identified by the purple halo or the wide purple margin around the spot. And that's because a Cercospora fungus produces a phytotoxin or a plant toxin called Cercosporin, and it is purple. So that purpling is pretty much an indicator uh, for us as we watch through this. So in Kentucky, we are finding that the Cercospora that's infecting hemp is Cercospora flagellaris. And this is one that infects a wide range of weeds. This is one that's occurring right in our fields and around our fields. So it's commonly known as a, a, the leaf spot on John, one of the leaf spots on Johnson grass. Uh, Cercospora flagellaris can also infect asters and amaranths. And it's one of the uh, Cercosporas that is known to cause purple seed stain in soybean. So this is one, it's pretty wide ranged. Um, it can affect other plants pretty severely, but it's not affecting hemp severely as we know it. Usually when we see Cercospora leaf spot, it's usually mixed in with some of the other leaf spots. It's very distinct, it's very dark, and that purpling is, is, pretty, is pretty alarming sometimes. But so far, this has not been a major disease. We're watching this one. We're interested in this one. But so far, this has not caused any yield losses whatsoever in hemp in Kentucky or anywhere else that we know of. The third leaf spot that I want to discuss, and this is the absolute most important one at this time, is hemp leaf spot or bipolaris leaf spot, as some call it. Uh, this is a new disease. This is one that um, caused by a pathogen that can affect uh, cereal grains and, and grasses. Um, we have not seen it on a dicot host until now. Um, and it causes a leaf spot in hemp. It causes a small round leaf spot, but this one will cause a tissue death called necrosis. So necrosis in between these spots and these spots will somewhat coalesce and we'll see uh, leaf death. In fact, if the bipolaris pathogen infects early in the season and it's a rainy season, it can absolutely decimate fields. We've seen 100% yield losses from the uh, hemp leaf spot. So one thing about this, this hemp leaf spot is that symptoms will begin to occur in uh, mid-July, especially if it's rainy, and it seems that there's no hot spot or direction or pattern to this uh, disease. It will affect all leaves through, through an entire plant and across an entire field. Um, all leaves, fan leaves and sugar leaves, will uh, become infected, um, as well as the, the bracts inside the flowers uh, or around the flowers. Um, and it seems to like hotter weather. We don't know about overwintering. Um, from what we know about other bipolaris pathogens is that it can overwinter in debris, fall in debris. But even fields that had not had hemp as a previous crop or had not had hemp in that location since maybe the 1940s, uh, we've seen severe disease and, and yield losses as a result. Uh, so we're, we're quite sure that there are alternative hosts in and around these fields, and uh, we're working on that as a research project. So this is one, we know it's here, we know it's established here, and, and not just in Kentucky. We've identified it in 18 different counties in Kentucky and 12 different states. So we know it's around, and those populations vary, so we know it's been here a while. Um, obviously, um, especially hemp grown for CBD, the cultivars that are out there and are commonly grown for CBD seem to be the most susceptible, much more susceptible than grain or fiber hemp. 
Here are some additional images of hemp leaf spot. And you'll see lots of spotting, um, the necrosis that occurs in between these spots. Uh, the spots can either be a light tan or a medium colored brown. So two different types of spots. Uh, that necrosis or the, the de tissue death in between those spots where you can still see the, the spot um, pretty distinct. So you'll see the spot is still here. I'm on the uh, lower left-hand image. Uh, also, the pathogen's name is Bipolaris gigantea. Gigantea meaning giant. And even take a look at this spot, and you'll see all the black um, little dashes. And those are, those are spores that are so large you can see them with the naked eye. Like I said earlier, I do want to point out that until now, this pathogen has been known to affect grasses and monocots. This is our first uh, report of it occurring on, on dicots. And the last pathogen, leaf spot pathogen, that I want to discuss today is septoria leaf spot. And septoria is a uh, common uh, pathogen. We all know septoria from other crops. Um, septoria occurs on tomato. Septoria can occur on brambles. So there are lots of septorias out there. This one, however, we just don't know the genus. We know that the um, collection of septoria from hemp that we have does not match any of the septorias. Um, does, does not The DNA sequences do not match any of the other Septoria, so we're not sure on this one. We're not sure uh, what the host range is, if any. Uh, distinctly septoria is the yellow halo that's happening around uh, these spots. So um, as soon as these spots begin to develop, the yellowing in between spots will expand and leaves will drop very quickly. We typically see septoria leaf spot uh, early in the season, so in June into maybe mid-July. When it starts getting hot, it seems to taper off. But septoria will start from the lower canopy and inner canopy, and uh, symptoms will work their way up the plants, especially as plants get large and those canopies start to close where the humidity is very high. Uh, so uh, sometimes growers will first notice those lower leaves falling. But septoria can be recognized by this yellow halo. Again, by the time the weather gets hot, it seems like septoria just shuts down or slows down significantly and plants recover. So we have not seen yield losses as a result of septoria leaf spot, but we have seen some pretty alarming um, leaf drop that um, really is distinct. Um, so we're watching this one, but hopefully it is not going to become a severe problem. Okay, now let's move to uh, blights and molds. And by blight, blight means quick death. A lot of times we'll think about blights, especially in flower in flower heads, so um, your cannabinoid type um, hemp um, and and molds. And mold, when we talk about mold, we see a colonization of fungi. So blights and molds have grouped together. Uh, so some are common blight to mold, botrytis or gray mold. We will see it colonize uh, seed heads, especially when the season is rainy at the end of the summer. Um, it's not very often that we have rainy, uh, rainy times at the time of harvest, but it is possible. Most importantly in the blight and mold category are the fusariums. So um, fusarium is a genus of fungi. Uh, there are different, there are different uh, species of fusarium and they're all different. So I want to make sure that as we talk about fusarium, we don't lump them in together, that they are indeed separate pathogens. Uh, so fusarium canker, remember I said earlier that a canker is a woody stem lesion. Uh, so fusarium canker is that lesion caused by a fusarium, fusarium solani species within that complex at the soil surface. Now your fusariums are soil-borne pathogens. They live their life in the soil. They survive in the soil. So when a soil-borne pathogen infects a, a plant crown, it'll do so right at soil level or just above soil level. Uh, fusarium solani or the fusarium canker pathogen really is attracted to wounded plants. 
this image in particular uh, was taken in a field where the black plastic, this was a plastic culture field, the black plastic had rubbed on the, uh, on the stem, caused a wound, and the fusarium was able to enter, and after that it began to girdle, so it began to expand and choke off that plant. So we saw uh, yellowing and, and defoliation on the upper plant parts. We'll also see wounding caused by string trimmers and other efforts for mechanical weed management because herbicides are limited in, in hemp production. So these images are that, that same field from the canker that I showed uh, in the previous slide. And uh, so as, as the summer gets hotter, the upper plant parts require more water um, the hotter it is outside, and with that restriction, there comes a point where, where that limited amount of vascular tissue can't keep up, and that's what's happening. So this was the, the upper plant symptom that resulted from that, that canker, that fusarium canker. All right, another fusarium type is fusarium head blight, and fusarium head blight is caused by fusarium graminiarum. Um, and this is the head blight that we know from corn and from cereals. Um, it, this is a dangerous one. Um, we expect that the fusarium graminiarum that, it, that can infect hemp can also uh, produce human toxins that are so dangerous that we know from head blight. So this is something that we're studying right now. Uh, we don't have a lot of information, but we have seen uh, fusarium head blight, especially on rainy years. We've seen it colonize the larger seed head, uh, seed and flower heads, especially those that are densely packed, will have a higher humidity. And within that high humidity environment, if the Fusarium graminiarum is present, it is able to really colonize, and uh, that's where our danger comes in. So this is something that all growers need to watch out for and to really inspect. Uh, we're also going to look at these as a post-harvest um, disease and we're going to look at some stored um, flour and grain to uh, get a better idea of how common uh, fusarium head blight is in hemp across Kentucky. And the third fusarium is fusarium wilt. Fusarium wilt is caused by fusarium oxysporum, but all the different forma specialis or the different types of fusarium oxysporum uh, tend to be host specific. So uh, what we know at this point about the fusarium wilt in hemp is that it is not the same as a lot of the fusarium wilts in other common crops. So this is another one that we're working on. Uh, we don't know if there's an alternative host. We don't know where it's coming from. So a lot of the old literature and maybe some amateur literature mentions fusarium wilt quite often. But from what we're seeing in Kentucky, fusarium wilt is not that common. We have very limited samples and um, confirmations of fusarium wilt in Kentucky. We are looking to make sure, but it seems that every time we have a suspect case, we're finding some other cause. So right now we are monitoring fusarium wilt. We're trying to identify exactly which, which one we have in hemp and to determine what the alternative hosts are, especially in terms of crop rotation. But at this point, it does not seem that fusarium wilt is a major problem in Kentucky. Okay, and the final disease in the blight and mold category, uh, Rhizoctonia aerial blight or web blight. So in terms of soybean, we call it aerial blight. And for instance, in mums, we call it web blight. But Rhizoctonia is another soil-borne pathogen. Um, it's a fungus and uh, it lives in the soil. It will cause damping off quite, quite readily, cause damping off, colonize weak plants. But in terms of rainy seasons, we can see it move into the upper plant parts especially when it's hot and rainy, uh, as canopies begin to close and those canopies become really dense. Uh, in some fields, we'll see it pretty severely, uh, but it doesn't occur that commonly. It seems, though, that when it does occur, the yield loss is pretty high.
Okay, so the final category I have for field hemp diseases is the root and crown rots. Um, and I've talked about a lot of these already. I'm not going to repeat, but in terms of root and crown rots, we have our group of fusariums that will affect kind of that crown right at the soil level, uh, damping off, damping off of seedlings. Um, pythium, remember pythium root rot from greenhouses. We will see pythium in the field, especially if it's wet. Recall that the pythiums are uh, water molds or oomycetes. So they can cause root rots and damping off, especially as weak plants will come into the area or if it's very rainy at the time of planting or if soil is very heavy. I just mentioned rhizoctonia in the previous slide. Recall that it can cause a damping off of seedlings as well. Um, we see occasionally we'll see timber rot or white mold, which is caused by sclerotinia. Um, but most importantly, and this is the image that you're looking at here, is southern blight. Southern blight is um, caused by a pathogen uh, that loves hot, wet weather. So if we have a rainy, hot summer like last year, we will definitely see some southern blight um, uh, disease particularly if the pathogen is present. In my experience, I see most southern blight in situations and in fields where the uh, field was previously fallowed or it was previously um, unmanaged pasture where there were lots of broadleaf weeds because uh, there's a very broad uh, host range uh, for this pathogen that includes a lot of broadleaf weeds. So when this pathogen comes in, um, it will it will infect and affect right at the soil level, right at that crown. You'll see the mycelia or the fuzzy fungal growth and those little uh, dots that you see, these little um, kind of beads that you see here. Those are sclerotia or survival structures that will fall into the soil and can live up to eight years in soil um, without even having a host. And again, weeds are an alternative host a lot of times, so you can really extend that, uh, that, that life cycle of this pathogen. So this is one that can really cause havoc in a hemp field if it is present. All right, and as I did with greenhouses, let's talk about abiotic problems in field hemp. And again, abiotic means non-living. So um, in terms of abiotic problems in hemp, we see probably, again, about half of our disease suspect um, samples that are submitted uh, to us seem to be something abiotic. Uh, some things to kind of point out is that hemp is an experimental crop. Growers are not going to put it on their best land. They're not going to put it in their prime spot. They're not going to plant their hemp uh, an experimental crop before they plant their primary crop. So hemp seems to often take a back seat. And when that happens, of course, it doesn't, um, doesn't get off to a good start. Like I said, with greenhouse hemp, we have a lot of new and inexperienced growers. So there have been some rookie mistakes that we have seen. And, um, you know, this is a really unstable market, unstable genetics, um, a lot of beginners. So sometimes uh, growers don't get the best plants in the first place. Uh, so there are a lot of situations that... Um, that growers, a lot of hurdles that, that these plants have to jump uh, jump through before they can get a good start. And then once they do get started, then of course there's weed pressure. So um, just kind of a lot of things that are, that, that are considerations um, when, when there are problems with a hemp crop. So here are some examples of some uh, of poor planting um, to the right. The plant was uh, put in with an auger, and so once everything's settled, the plant is just too deep. The uh, hole there is holding water, so of course you can see that plant is dead. The plant to the left it was planted about six inches too high, and um, this was one I was called in. Plants were starting to die, and uh, as, as it got hot and dry in the summertime, there were just not enough roots in the soil to really sustain those plants. So the hotter and drier it got, the more these plants uh, collapsed as a result of just insufficient water uptake. So these are some examples, and, and definitely our abiotic problems are not limited to just these two situations. So how do we manage hemp diseases? So that is 
the, the big question. Well, first of all, we need proper identification. Until we identify the pathogen, we don't know what the history is, what the life cycle is, and how we can intercept and break that cycle. In, in regard to greenhouse diseases, um, sanitation. Sanitation is the absolute most important thing that a greenhouse grower can do. Um, and sanitation means clean. Keep everything clean. Everything from a foot bath to disinfecting greenhouses in between crops and just keeping everything clean, not reusing pots, or if you do reuse pots, to disinfest them in between. Never reuse soil or media and just things like dragging hoses around the ground and, and knowing that soil falls and debris falls under benches and around benches. All of that type of cleaning is absolutely critical. Um, roguing. Roguing means just throwing away diseased plants. If a plant is, is diseased, it cannot be cured. So the quicker a grower can throw away or rogue a diseased plant, the less risk those surrounding healthy plants um, are at becoming infected. So very important sanitation. The environment, and I talked about this earlier, but maintaining an environment that is not conducive for, um, for the plant pathogens. Um, your humidity, very important. Keep the humidity as low as you can. Monitor humidity. Make sure that that free water component is not going to be um, available for plant pathogens. And uh, so relative humidity is what's happening in the air, but soil moisture has to be maintained. So we, of course we have to keep our plants watered, but overwatering it's not just dangerous for plants, but it also provides an environment for a lot of your soil-borne pathogens to take hold and to complete their life cycles, particularly the oomycetes. Air circulation in terms of exchanging air for to lower humidity, and also the more we can circulate air, the faster we're drying leaves and upper plant parts. And the faster they dry, the less chance our pathogens have for infecting. And finally, temperature. Um, as I said earlier, pathogens need moderate temperatures to complete their life cycles. So we can sometimes manipulate temperatures just a little bit. Um, also, temperature uh, will affect plant health, so keeping plants healthy. And so my next bullet is plant vigor. Keeping plants vigorous and healthy, absolutely critical. And our horticulturists and agronomists are going to have, have videos that are addressing those types of things. However, keep in mind that a, a, an unhealthy plant is much more susceptible to infection by lots of different types of pathogens. So um, some really kind of common sense ones, prevent wounding um, because wounds oftentimes are open doors for um, a lot of these, these pathogens to be able to enter and infect. Um, knowing what your soil analysis is, uh, doing tissue analyses, making sure your fertility and your plant health is optimum, again, um, will keep plants resilient. And uh, managing insects and arthropods, because those are more wounds and more stresses that can weaken plants and make them more susceptible to infection by plant pathogens. And finally, and notice I've put this bullet last, is fungicides. Um, there are not a lot of fungicides labeled for hemp. We're very limited at this point. Right now, biologicals and botanicals are about all that we have. Um, and biologicals and botanicals are not the same as your typical chemical uh, products. And that's a debate for another day. But um, we have a very limited number. They don't quite work the same. They have to be used differently. Um, but whichever you use, KDA, the Kentucky Department of Agriculture, maintains a list of approved hemp pesticides. And because this is a video that's going to be watched at a later date than I'm recording it, I am not going to address those at this point. So please reference the KDA uh, pesticide list. Okay, so field diseases. How do you manage a field disease? Well, get started on the right foot. Make sure you've got a good site that's prepared very well, good drainage, both internal and surface drainage. Uh, maintain your fertility, manage your weeds, uh, those types of things. Again, those are horticultural and, and agronomic issues. 
but a good healthy plant again I can't say enough about uh, being resilient and, and much more tolerant of a lot of pathogen infections sanitation I talked about sanitation in the greenhouse but sanitation is a little bit different in the field uh, but keeping disease plants out roguing or throwing away anything that's diseased especially if it's early in the season making sure that you don't have that spread um, environment keeping uh, air circulating as much as possible plant spacing row spacing and orientation of rows will keep air circulating and the more we can circulate air the faster we're drying our leaves and uh, the, the more we're able to lower humidity in between plants and in the canopy especially as those canopies get wider and this is particularly true for the uh, hemp grown for flower and finally and I've said this for greenhouses I'll just skim right over it plant vigor I can't say enough about it get started with healthy stock plants or make sure your seeds are off to a very good start prevent any kind of wounding um, soil and tissue analyses as much as needed work with your county agent making sure you've got optimal health there manage insects and arthropods and knowing the timing of of each step so timing is important it's important in terms of when to plant how to plant um, it's also important in terms of when to apply any of your your products okay um, again this video is recorded in May 2020 um, this at this point these are the fun some of the fungicides approved uh, by the KDA for use on hemp um, at the very top you'll see we've got a couple of 24 C uh, products that are out there uh, we've got 125 B and a range of minimal risk products again depending on the state that you're in and particularly depending on timing it is very important that you refer not just to your state's um, list of approved products but also read labels very well talk to your county agent and make sure that the, uh, the most updated information is available to you um, I've said earlier that biologicals and botanicals are not aggressive fungicides or fungistats so any of these that will be used should be used as preventatives and pre by preventative I mean before the pathogen infects so there's the infection period usually a latent period where the the pathogen is not uh, or the symptoms are not visible and then what we call disease is the actual symptom so symptoms can occur days weeks sometimes months after infection so when we're starting to think about using some of these biologicals and botanicals they must be utilized as a preventative meaning they've got to be applied before infection occurs and knowing that life cycle knowing the exact pathogen that you're dealing with is really important because that will help prevent infection from occurring in the first place and they're much, the diseases are much easier to manage as prevent from a preventative standpoint all right so what is your risk for disease loss um, is disease going to really take your crop out is there going to be some financial loss well that's a very hard question to answer it depends it depends on what the disease is where it occurs which plant parts it's affecting uh, the time of infection the earlier infection occurs the more likely disease can become more severe by by harvest time so there's a longer period the pathogenicity of the actual pathogen some pathogens are more aggressive than others some of them are not really a, a problem or not that we know yet so it depends on the actual pathogen and how aggressive it is um, the environment or the weather the rainier it is the more likely disease is going to become a major problem if it gets hot and dry as the season goes on that will almost always slow disease with the exception of things like southern blight that is um, usually more aggressive as temperatures get hot and finally what is the health of your plant in as you begin uh, so plant health equals resilience so healthy plants are much more resilient when it comes to infections or the development of disease
Uh, the image here, um, so Dr. Pierce talked about uh, root development in uh, hemp transplants. This is a, an extreme example, but not an uncommon example, where roots were uh, binded and, um, and very limited on very large plants. So of course, when disease sets in, a plant that is not healthy or doesn't have sufficient uptake of water and nutrients is just not going to be able to overcome even the most minor uh, disease uh, scenarios. All right, so a couple of considerations just as we close down. Um, I'm always going to ask lots of questions when um, there's a suspect disease, um, but once the plants are in my hands, I've got to determine what the problem is. Is what we're looking at a primary disease or could it be a secondary problem as a result of something else? Okay, so a secondary disease might be something like a, a gr botrytis gray mold as a result of maybe a very high humidity, or it might be that fusarium canker as a result of um, a mechanical wound. So whether it's primary or secondary is really important, especially in helping growers prevent problems in the future. Um, as we see fungi and bacteria, we've got to determine whether it's, a sap, it's saprophytic or, if it, or it's pathogenic. So remember, there are a lot of pathogens or some are very weak or opportunistic. Some are not pathogenic at all. Some are saprophytic. So we've got to be able to tease those, those, uh, those details apart and determine what's really going on. Sometimes we... We, we've got to ask lots of questions to find out whether this problem was preventable. Uh, some, some pathogens, for instance, the, the bipolaris or the hemp leaf spot, uh, we haven't figured out uh, what the preventable scenario would be on that one. But there are others, and I mentioned the fusarium canker a minute ago, that's one that is preventable because that one is, is more of a secondary um, disease. So we have to kind of weigh out all of these different scenarios to determine what's happening. And finally, um, is this an abiotic or a cultural problem? How can this be prevented in the future? And is there a disease uh, connected to this at all? Uh, sometimes there is and it's secondary or, or even tertiary, and other times there's no disease at all. So we have to ask all of those questions. So how do you confirm disease? How do you know? Plant pathogens are microscopic. We don't expect growers to be able to make that, that confirmation or, or, or diagnose that, that problem. So my recommendations is to always start with your county agent. County agents are highly qualified. They can work through, they can ask lots of questions and they can help you determine what the problem may be. Uh, secondly, your agent will determine if a specialist is needed, and if so, which specialist is needed. Um, if at that point they determine that it is a disease and it needs to come to one of our plant disease diagnostic labs, they will help growers to initiate that submission. So here in Kentucky, our plant disease diagnostic lab accepts samples from um, within Kentucky only. We do not ex accept out-of-state samples. Uh, when we do accept a sample, there is no charge at this time for samples, um, but the sample does route through our county extension offices. So again, um, develop a relationship with your county agent. Your county agent will help you with the forms. They have forms. They will help gather all of the information needed, help, help you package it up if that is necessary, uh, but your county agent cannot transport that sample for you. Um, it, it's the grower that is likely going to mail the sample to one of our labs, um, but your county agent will help you determine how to make that happen. Once the sample gets to us, uh, we have two different labs, one in Western Kentucky and one on campus in Lexington. We will confirm that pathogen if there is one at all, um, and we will do that through micro microscopy or through molecular methods, whichever is needed. Uh, keep in mind, though, that these are plant disease diagnostic labs, um, so we focus on plant diseases and plant pathogens. Okay, so finally, um, I am going to close with um, my website, 
uh, kyhempdisease.com. This is where I've got um, some articles on, on topics, uh, sometimes a disease focus, other times on, on things like sanitation. So um, at this point, it's not updated, but there are still lots of articles on there, and I will be adding some more shortly. So this is the way that I'm trying to get images and to help growers um, try to narrow down some of the, the considerations as they, um, they, they try to identify what problems might be lurking in their hemp greenhouses or fields.